Four-time BAFTA-nominated composer Murray Gold is one of the UK's best-known writers of television music. It's a genre that so often demands economy and instant originality, and those are qualities that Gold has displayed with great style over the last decade or so. Early on in his career, Gold seemed to glide with ease from one landmark project to another. Dramas like Queer as Folk, Vanity Fair and Shameless featured offbeat, quirky scores that revealed Gold's preference for the controversial and unusual. But it was in 2005 when writer Russell T Davis rebooted the classic BBC sci-fi series Doctor Who for a new generation that Murray Gold's huge popular appeal was established. Writing a huge amount of music for each episode with the full might of the BBC National Orchestra of Wales at his disposal, Murray Gold's scores for the series have become his signature and the adventures of this timeless Time Lord would simply not be the same without him. Gold has become the soul at the centre of the series. Here at the Royal Albert Hall's Elgar Room, Murray Gold is talking to me about his career so far and about the art of writing music for television. One of the things that I always used to do was I was always interested in recording. So I would take um, a tape recorder and do that thing that kids can sometimes work out that you can do, which is like you record yourself playing the piano and then you play it back and you take another recorder and you record everything, you playing the, 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 the playback of you playing the piano and then you doing something else on top with like bashing some spoons or something. So you've got percussion and piano suddenly. And, and then I realised there was a thing called a four-track recorder, which actually does that miraculously in one box. <laughs> so I, uh, I just nagged and nagged and saved until I could get one of those. What's interesting is that it's a, actually a very common story for, for people who've ended up writing for film and, and, and television, that they, they really learn how to do it in the theatre. Right. Uh, because you're having to learn to usually write for a small number of theater. instruments. Yeah. And the function is ve it's ve often very specific. Uh, Theatre's so. exactly like film in that you have, you have one play's worth of, of, of entries to make your point, and you, then you go home. You don't, it's not like Doctor Who, where nine episodes later you suddenly realise you could have done something really clever with that melody. It's like everyone left about 15 weeks ago, by the way. <laughs> with theatre, you, you, you have to, you know, you, 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 you've got to get the smell of what the thing is about, go right to the heart of it, play a bit of music which lasts about 10 seconds before the, before the curtain goes up and it's got to tell you everything about where the thing is set, what it's about, what kind of tone it's got, whether it's a comedy or, you know. And then you'll maybe have another bit of in, um, music in the entr'acte, you know, and then, and then one um, at, the in, at the interval. So, yeah, you're right. It's, it's a very precise uh, thing to do. When I sit at a piano, it's like that blank piece of paper, it, it, you know, for any composer. Um, like in George Orwell in 1984 when he, get, you know, he looks at his blank, creamy notebook and you think, wow, anything is possible here. And um, a lot of it is uh, um, sort of down to how you play the piano. And I like to... Theatre stuff got, you know, a documentary director comes in and then it, it turned out to be a guy called Mark Munden. In fact, I tried to play him some stuff. I'd gone round to his house with a tape and he'd really liked it and he said, it's kind of got a style and it's really transparent. He said, I can't use you for this, but maybe I'll use you for the next thing. What happened, which you can never guarantee with anything, you just, this one of those things where, you know, the next thing... I knew, he said, oh, and the BBC have just given me this Sunday night drama called, you know, we're doing a, a, a costume drama of Vanity Fair. And I was like, great, I'm so happy for you, enjoy it. Um, and then he said, no, no, but I'd love you to do it. <laughs> When it was delivered, I got this memo, because I don't think there were emails in those days. It was like 98. Um, I got this memo and it just said, 
Is this a joke? <laughs> There's so often a temptation for composers to look for the exactly the right kind of music for the right kind of setting and the right kind of period. And you've sort of done the opposite, but it works perfectly because it gives it such energy. It goes right to the heart of, the, of what the show is about. It's called Vanity Fair. It's about the, the, you know, the decline of middle classes and the elevation and then decline of, of a woman um, who uses every every, you know, all of her womanly tenacity um, to rise to the top of society and collapse. So it's, it's theatrically, it's, it's about decay and deprivation and, you know, the bourgeoisie and sort of, you know, absence of values. So, so it, it just felt like it, it should be somewhat like, you know, Kurt Weill, kind of Weimar Republic, kind of all these kind of... Whatever. I mean, I, tr I try not to even ask questions about that because you get so literal about things. You know, it sounds a cliche, but if, it, if, it, if you feel like it works, just do it. Paul Abbott had been watching it, and Russell was looking for a composer for Queer as Folk, and it was, they were, it was the exact same time, I think, probably December 98 or something like that. And um, <laughs> Paul... Abbott and Nicola Schindler, and I, you know, worked a lot with both of them, and they're both geniuses of, of their field. They said, who ar who's around who doesn't write, this is one of those things, who doesn't write TV music? We, don't, we just don't want TV music. And it's like, I didn't have a clue what TV music even was anyway. I don't even know what they mean by that. I still don't really. But um, I think what, you know, they, they, what they mean is they don't want stuff that just fills in, in the holes. They want tunes and melodies and things like that. Um, and Paul Abbott said, oh, did you see Vanity Fair? And they said, no. And he said, well, it's really, you know, what about that? So I'm in this hotel room, with, which I was sharing with my brother, and suddenly this phone rings. He goes, oh, Murray, um, the, uh, that score for Vanity Fair was outrageous. And I said, who is this? He said, it's Russell Davis. I've done this thing. It's called Queer as Folk. I'm more proud of it than anything I've ever done in my life. All of the shows that I did, you know, not Vanity Fair, but subsequently, from this were northern working class drama and it was you know it always fitted in with the philosophy of life that I had that you know life is just not a whole bed of roses but when it's romantic and you're you know deprived you know in economically or emotionally or in, in any form that, 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 that these stories like clocking off and shameless and queer as folk are set in you know, a little bit of love goes a long way and it means a lot. And so I would write these quite ro romantic and offbeat scores to, to stuff and I would make it triumphant and romantic and happy where you wouldn't expect it to be. It just felt like, oh, what this is actually about is the birth of sexuality. So it needed to have sort of like that Eddie Cochran rock and roll thing. So that's where all the strumming came from. If I'm working on a show, I will do 40 versions of something myself, and then I will allow one out. I just never put three. If you don't like this one, here's the other one. Right. I'd just be like, well, this is it. Because I've just sat through, I've done 40. And obviously, you know, sometimes people just go, God, that's ghastly. What on earth were you thinking about? And then I resign. Do you? I mean, I do, yeah. Right. Because some composers because just say, okay, they go, back to the, they go back to the drawing board and start again. I'm you... terrible at doing stuff again. Unless it's on for something that I've seen. Because if somebody tells me that they've seen something and I haven't seen it, I mean, I can try and see it, but I've tried my best to see what, what is in, in the material right at the beginning. I mean, I haven't sat and done 40 versions of something so that I can, you know, someone can effectively tell me, you're just not seeing what this is about. I mean, a, a little sit down and chat isn't going to help that because that's just Q1, so you might as well... Bail. But a lot of composers say that it's much harder to try and encapsulate the spirit of a series in 30 or seconds or a minute than it is to actually do a much more expansive film score. Well, that is true. I mean, sometimes it, it does take to get to the end. 
before you know what the beginning should be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I actually had this thing when I was working with Frank Oz, who was like, I did Death at a Funeral, and I arrived in, in New York, I was staying with my brother, and um, where he'd asked everyone to come to work on the show, and I had this back room, a bedroom, it was super hot and there was no air conditioning, and Frank Oz came and said, I'm presenting this show at Tribeca Grand tomorrow and I need, need the end cue, it needs to be happy. And I said, I haven't even seen the film. He said, I don't care, I need the end cue, it needs to be happy, just go and do it. I mean, what the hell do you do? I mean, you just play a C major and play it dun dun dun, you know, and that's, that's happy, you want it happy, that's happy. Uh, and, and was he happy? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you mentioned uh, Paul Abbott earlier, and uh, we'll move on to Shameless, because that's another one, like uh, Queer as Folk, that really, I mean, it came straight out of the box, immediately hit you uh, with a style and a confidence. It was an, the most incredible show I've ever seen, the first two series. And w again, when it arrived, on <laughs> it arrived on video, and it was shot as if it a home video, I mean, it just looked terrible. But there was just something about when you got to the, the end of the first episode, which I think was James McAvoy punching out a bouncer and a couple of, you know, Manchester lasses just laughing and looking at him thinking, like, you're a hero. And Frank and everything about it, it just made me want to jump out the window in a good way. I mean, this is music. You're like, oh, my God, this is like rock and roll. This is the most rock and roll television show I've ever seen. <laughs> Now, nobody's saying that Chatsworth Estate is the Garden of Eden, but it's been a good home to us, to me, Frank Gallagher, and me kids, who I'm proud of, cos every single one of them reminds me a little of me. They can all think for themselves, which they've me to thank for. When I do a show, when I do anything in life at all, um, you know, I try and milk it for all of the philosophical content I can get from it because you're working with people who are really bright who are passionate about stuff who've got stuff to tell you and you're basically privileged to be spending time with them you know I grew up in Portsmouth a middle class family and I'm hanging out with real you know northern working class writers who've got amazing stories from themselves of the like of which are as foreign to me as they would be to someone from Mars. I was up in West Yorkshire Playhouse and because I'd written this play and it was being performed and Christopher Eccleston, Eccleston was starring in it and, um, and he kept on vanishing um, and not learning his lines because he was doing screen tests for this stupid thing and um, obviously which nobody would watch and why isn't he doing my play properly and, um, and, and then he, he came and he said to me oh yeah this, it's amazing, it's amazing Maury. It's proper stuff. Like, what? It, it, and he's like, it's amazing stuff like one of the companions goes and sees their father die and it's proper drama. And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, we could just do my play, please. Um, <laughs> and, and all of the Doctor Who lot came up to see the play because they were supporting Chris. And then there was the announcement and then Chris sort of went into a sort of, he had played cat and mouse with the press. So I was right there when all of that was happening but it was nothing at all to do with me because that was some you know it was about April or May 2004 I just didn't think about doing Doctor Who at all really um, and I got then I got an email and, and I, I think I self subconsciously pretended that I didn't want to do it and told myself that as a kind of suck, sucker for for it you know not happening and and then I got this email very close to the time when it had to be finished. Like, it was October, and the dub was in November. And it just said, <laughs> I'm doing this thing, I don't know how it'll work out, but um, I should have asked you this months ago. Um, <laughs> do you want to do the music for Doctor Who? And I was like, and I just wrote back, yes, that would be great, thanks. And that... <laughs> 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 so then I had to go down to set and see things happening. and. and and I, I, I made this, you know, I made this tape 
and I studied everything and I made this incredibly electronic thing. And then I went and played it to Russell and Julie. And I think right at the end, after about seven and a half minutes of electronic stuff, there was this string chord and they go, oh, we like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, I think what you're telling me is you want strings. And they said, yes. And I said, well, we don't have any budget for any strings or anything like that, and you need the music. And that, then they said, well, just what's that? That sounds good. That's nice. I was like, yeah, OK, well, I'll do that then. And, and then I had to go and change my computer because I used, I don't know, I was using a computer program called Cubase. And I had to go and buy these fake strings. And I had to plug them in using a software program I didn't know how to use. And then I, and two weeks later, I had to deliver the score. And you know, um, and none of it's got any reverb on it or anything like that, because um, I didn't realise that you should put reverb on string samples, <laughs> otherwise, because they don't sound very realistic. Um, and um, and that was broadcast. <laughs> I have to ask you about the theme because, of course, that is the thing that everyone knew was going to be in place. It had to be in place. Right. So, and you will have known essentially the responsibility of doing it. So, I didn't. You must have done. <laughs> you must have known the theme anyway. I knew the theme. I mean, I, I was I was watched Doctor Who a lot. I mean, did they say we need a new arrangement? That no. <laughs> <laughs> what What happened was it came a bit later. I think I'd done maybe one or two episodes and. Um, because we had this big amount of time, December to April, before it was broadcast properly. And I think they were increasingly finding that as they played it, um, the theme just didn't cut through. And I mean, it cuts through. It's like sonically, nothing cuts through more. You can't tame that thing. It's a very empty, lonely sounding theme, which is fantastic um, and was fantastic. It's just an incredible piece of music. Mm. Um, and it, it, it sort of puts this fear you know, into, inside you of of being left alone in the dark and with the visuals and everything. Obviously, it's iconic, but it was a very different tone. You know, the show was about love and affection and it was warm. I mean, it, it was warm occasionally in previous incarnations of the show, but this was overflowing with war. I mean, it was the warmest thing on television. And why? <laughs> why Doctor Who? How did that happen? You know, and so... You know, you get to the end and it's incredible and this girl has been effectively seduced to go off in, through space and time with the tall dark stranger and suddenly you just have lonely <laughs> and, and scary and it just didn't work. So they said, we, we don't want lonely and scary, so can you just, you know, f do something, do something, please. I didn't even know there were 13 episodes. I just got through episode one and then they said, there's, you know, and then there's another one and then there's another one and then there's another one and then there's another one. And then it's like... <laughs> I, I, I don't think I ever asked any one single thing about what the show would entail or what, you know, beyond that initial meeting um, with Russell and Julie. Um, the rest of the direction, of the, I, I, the advice I got was minimal. Um, but that episode did have all of the themes in it, that all of the main themes were in that episode that finished up in the, the 13th episode. So they all stayed through it. I just went about it in the exact same way that I would any other drama, as in treat these characters sincerely. Treat them like their hopes and expectations are the, your hopes and expectations. Don't second guess them. Be transparent. If you love them, show you love them. If you don't love them, show you... No, I mean, it, no, never, never show you don't love a character. <laughs> It's going to eat us. 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 Well, maybe we're going to eat it, but I don't like the ox. Stop. Let's see. Tiny shot. I mean, if I had my screwdriver, I could probably send a pulse and stun it. Well, what is your screwdriver? Well, concentrating on the pluses. Within reach. 
you know, there's a real chance the way it's wedging the doorway is keeping its mouth open. There is. Just agree with me, because I've only got two goes, and then it's your turn. Two goes. Two arms. Right there. Okay. Join him out. Open wide. It's fantastic to have the orchestra. I mean, the, the number of notes that I write and that Ben orchestrates. Well, we, I was going to mention Ben Foster, because he, he's your sort of right-hand man on this project, isn't he? He is, yeah. Ben orchestrates from my um, MIDI files, basically. A MIDI file is... Uh, I, I will give a piece of music that sounds like that to Ben, um, and um, he will notate it for the instruments of the orchestra. My versions come in varying degrees. Like, sometimes if we're really pushed... Because, like, I did... I had to write the music for... Not, not the Christmas Carol, but actually the, the one that followed that, the Doctor Widow and the Wardrobe. Because of various things to do with the schedule, I had to write that in 10 days. So, and that was about an hour's worth of music um, and for orchestra. So I would just, just sit down and write first thing in the morning and just try and, I mean, trying to get through 10 minutes a day, which actually for me is, is not r unusual, but it's still spiritually draining. One of the unusual things about the Christmas Carol episode is that music is also part of the narrative in a sense. Right. You've got Catherine Jenkins as a guest star in the programme and she sings in it, but she sings in it for a reason. Right. It's written into the script. Yeah. There's a song to be sung in it. I hadn't it? read the script, actually. I'd, it had been sitting in my inbox. Well, I don't have an inbox, but you know what I mean. And uh, Beth, um, the previous exec producer, um, had, had said, You've read, have you read the script, Murray? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's great. Fantastic. What a script. Um, and she said, so have you done the song? And I said, um, <laughs> there's a song? And she said, yes, you, you know that bit towards the end where somebody sings and saves the entire universe and because they've been let out of their prison for one day, which the person who's been in love with them for all their life and it turned him into a really miserable bastard... Um, has been in, and it, he releases her for one day and she sings to him and it's going to be one of those kind of iconic moments on British television. I was like, oh, that song. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. <laughs> and, she, and then she said, well, Catherine Jenkins is flying in from Russia on Friday. And I was like, which Friday? You know, <laughs> she said, it, to, as in now is Wednesday, tomorrow is Thursday and the next day is Friday. And I was like, fantastic. When you are here, music is all around. When you are here, music is all around. By this point, the Christmas specials in particular are getting 11, 12 million people watching them. On Christmas Day, a family experience, one of the few, I guess, on television that we get these days. Do you ever even remotely think about that while you're doing it? Do you feel that pressure? No, not at all, no. I mean, I just, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think I probably feel... I'm like the old guard on Doctor Who now, you know? I'm the one that's <laughs> been there all the time, and um, I feel like... If I respond to something a certain way, I think every, to some extent, people use me as an emotional gauge for, you know, what it's about. I mean, it has even been known that somebody has asked, do I like it, as if it mattered. 
<laughs> from within the, you know, from, you know, what does Murray think about it? Because normally that question is only put to, well, what did, you know, the people with the power think about it? You um, have the power. I don't have the power. I just, like, <laughs> occasionally someone listens to me. <laughs> <laughs> when you associate a theme with a character you love, of course it's going to get the emotional drive that the, the you know, the Who theme is always going to be Doctor Who, that's what it is. But, you know, when I am the Doctor represents Matt Smith, and he will, it will always represent Matt Smith for people now, that's just done. able to support yourself somehow you have to have a roof over your head but you have to try and meet people who are either putting on plays or making stuff for the internet whatever it is you have to do stuff all the time you have to churn out music because it's all very well spending five years you know waiting and do, writing your masterpiece but you've got to be able to write music very fast every single day because when that time comes, you're not going to get any run-up for it. You've got to hit the ground running. So hopefully that time will come, but you have to just use every means possible. You have to be a street fighter about it, because if you're not in the privileged section of daughter, son of somebody famous, if you don't... You know, if you're not born and bred in L.A., if you, all of these things make it more difficult for people to attract attention. But never attract attention by waving stuff in people's face so that you really tick them off. You know, you want, a, you want a bit of pull towards you. You want people to see your stuff. And you just want people to feel that there's... And don't try and do what everybody else does. I just got so tired of hearing people doing imitations of Hans Zimmer. You know, because <laughs> they're 21, 22 years old. And you're like, why are you trying to do Hans Zimmer? Hans Zimmer already does Hans Zimmer. <laughs> What you want to do is come to the thing from a different angle and just express yourself constantly. And if you, I mean, I know this sounds idealistic, but if you are doing it because you love doing it, then you're never going to, there's no bad side to that, is there? It's no bad side. You just, you know, I, I, I sometimes make this joke, like, don't tell anyone that I would do this even if I wasn't paid to, because then they won't pay me. <laughs> the things that I choose to do, I... I, I I have to have a way into them. I have to love them, because otherwise I don't know how I'm going to, to work on them. I just allow myself to make myself upset while I'm watching this thing. And sometimes it's ridiculous and it seems really narcissistic um, if in one way. But I will sit there imagining something and I will bawl my eyes out. You know, and, and in the end, it's like... It's really good to be able to trust that mechanism because that is ultimately... Any, there's probably tons of you here that can write music and it's not really, you know, music is an art and, and this is more of a sort of craft thing and a sort of um, just... You can, you can make somebody cry with one little piano chord. It's just about where you're putting that stuff. Um, and as, as Richard Bellis, the film critic, wrote, writing film music is not writing film scores. You know, it's where it goes. And so I really trust my inner mechanism. It's the, one of the only things about myself I do trust is my own inner mechanism for, for working out what is going on in a scene and what people will respond to.